Harp on Sports, the bar, podcast, media, audio, and radio network. What do we have in store for you on this edition of the program? A little SEC showcase as, well, preseason media accolades have been handed out. We're still a month away, a little over a month away from the first college football game. Something that just speaks to the dominance of Alabama and Georgia, not only in this conference, but in all of college football. The way the media voted, based on the players in the SEC this year, shouldn't have happened. I'm going to explain that a little bit more coming up, where the Gators are picked fifth in the East. Is that right? So we're going to look at that. What else do we have in store for you? Oh boy, the, the Rays being plundered. 4-14 Four and 14 in the month of July. They have gone from a nine-game lead six weeks ago to four games back of the Orioles in the loss column. Yikes. Is there a solution? Is there an end in sight? I'm going to explain to you why that's going on. Also, baseball, Hall of Fame weekend. They punch two tickets into Cooperstown. Scott Rowland, Fred McGriff. Next year's class could have as many as five guys get in. I don't think they're going to get five, but as many as five could get in. So we'll dive into that as well. And also, the Open Championship takes place this weekend. Unless there's a big name at the top, it's a dud. So we've had an eh season when it comes to golf in the majors. Harp on Sports, the bar, podcast, media, audio, radio, network. Follow, share, like, subscribe at Harp on Sports Twitter, at Harp on Sports Instagram. Harp on Sports Facebook page, Harp on Sports YouTube channel, The Bar. Auditory Route, The Bar, Buzzsprout, Spotify, Apple Podcasts. Of course, harponsports.com as well. You can check out the page as well. Okay. Uh, oh, boy. Yikes. Yikes. Going to start off, well, I want to start off with the Rays. I went through and looked at some of these numbers. 4-14 Four and 14 in the month of July. The team went from a nine-game lead, late stages of May, early stages of June. Here we are, August right around the corner. They're four games back of the Orioles in the loss column. Now, the Orioles have played four more games in the Rays. The problem is that is you can make up wins, you can't make up losses. Two games out overall if you want to play that game. One thing that matters to me is the loss column. Now, the Rays, what's going on? Every team hits the skids at some point, but this is nasty. The other thing the Rays have going against them, this division's loaded. The Red Sox are supposed to be bad this year. They're above 500. they They're hot and cold as well. But the Yankees, Aaron Judge coming back, they played well this weekend. And then you look around at the Blue Jays and the Orioles. The Orioles are red hot. Are the Rays still the favorite in that division? Probably not. Probably not. And still 70 games, 65 se- games to go, 65, 70 games to go. So there's still some time to figure this out. But I went through and looked at some things here. How about this? Because I think numbers are important. Randy or Rosarino. One home run. Four, this is the last 15 games. So they're 4-14 four in the month of July. So the last eight, eight, 18 games, right? Last 15 games for Randy or Rosarino. One home run, four RBI, hitting 179. Wander Franco, one home run, four RBI, hitting 161. So the last half month, Randy Rosarina, Wander Franco have combined for two home runs, eight RBI, and are hitting 168. 30 games when Wander Franco. And Randy or Rosarina give you 30 games and they go, you have two home runs, eight RBI and are hitting 168, you're in trouble. And look, some other guys have played out of their minds. Diaz has played well. I just, looking at it from a realistic perspective, do they need to make a move? Yes, probably. I know that one of the names I keep looking down here, Dave Robertson from the Mets, apparently he's available, but... Is bullpen help going to help you here? Is a guy that, look, he's having a good year. What's he, 2-0, and and his ERA is right around 2? If the the Mets know he's got $3.6 million left on his deal, if the Mets aren't going anywhere, might as well get a young prospect out of him the final two months of the year. 
But is that going to make a difference if you're the Rays? Maybe a little bit. A couple years ago, what who'd they go? They went and got Nelson Cruz. They went and got a big slugger. You know, Shohei Otani. That's that's never going to happen ever. Those guys out there that are available. I mean, would the Mets part with Verlander or Scherzer? Probably not. But even if you're the Rays, you still can't you can't afford them. And the guys that are out there that that, that can help you, the, the Rays now are a foundation problem. Foundation problem. Now the Marlins come into town. They need to start stockpiling some series wins here. Again, still a lot of time. Or some of the names that were mentioned last week. Jordan Montgomery, Jack Flaherty. No, no, no. I know they're looking for another arm. But their problem right now is your two big studs. Randy Rosarina, Wanda Franco. Combined last 30 games. Two home runs, eight RBI, hitting 168, 169. That's why you're losing. That's why you're losing. And Repetis and, and again, Diaz, they did a nice job. What did I see in there? Paredes, he got four home runs the last two weeks. That's pretty good. I mean, <laughs> he's raking, man. He's having a heck of a run. Problem is nobody else is. So, you know, you find me any team in baseball, your two big studs, the two guys you count on are struggling. And I go back to June 23rd, Kevin Cash bench, benching Wander Franco, where he stuck their chest out and said, that'll teach him. He needed to teach him a lesson. Since then, now, is that why? No. Probably not. But everybody loves to, I'm going to teach this millionaire a lesson. All right, how's it going? Huh? Did it work? Things were going really, really well. It's kind of like tinkering with a perfect formula. Don't do it, Coke. Then you get new Coke. No, no, no leave it, it, it's working. Leave it alone. So there we go. From the race to the Hall of Fame, Scott Rowland and Fred McGriff both getting in. What, Fred McGriff, he's 59 years old. It took about, what, 18 years for Fred to get in? It's probably too long. <laughs> Not probably too long. It is too long. And 18 years after he retired, I should say. And Scott Rowland was his sixth try. The guy was one of the top two or three third basemen of his era. So, yeah, these guys make sense. They did Next year is where the fun begins. Because, to me, there's one guy next year that's a lock. There's multiple guys are going to get in, but the one guy that's a lock next year, he's on the board for the first time, Adrian Beltre. Adrian Beltre has 3,166 hits, 477 home runs. Man, this dude hit four, four over 450 home runs and had over 3,100 hits. I don't even know how that's a debate. Adrian Beltre's in. And then is where your history comes into play. Todd Helton, last year, got 72.2% of the vote. 369 home runs, 2,500 hits. History will tell us that he'll get up over 75%. So Todd Helton and Todd Helton and Adrian Beltre should get in. A third guy, based on voting in percentage, is Billy Wagner. Billy Wagner last year at 68.1%. History will tell us, based on Hall of Fame voting, that 97% of the time when somebody gets that many votes, the next year they get in. Now, will Billy Wagner jump 7%? I don't know. I think you may see Billy Wagner about 73, 74. But Billy Wagner is going to get in. It's just a question of if it's next year or the year following, which would be his last year of eligibility right by the way. And then there's a, then you have the slew of guys out there that aren't going to get in, like the Pettits, the K-Rods, the Sheffields. I'm looking at guys that are on the, the veteran end of the ballot. Beltre's in. Helton will get in. Then, the, the, then Billy Wagner, of the guys that have climbed that escalator, he'd be the next one that should get in. But then, oh my gosh, the guy that's not in that's criminal that he's not in is Andrew Jones. Andrew Jones has 10 gold gloves and 466 home runs. I mean, Ozzie Smith won double-digit gold gloves. Greg Maddox won double-digit gold gloves. You know, you have guys out there that, that Omar Vizquel won a ton of them, but they don't have 466 home runs. 
The fact that Greg Maddox did what he did and then won as many games as he did defensively shows you that he's elite. Andrew Jones, good gracious, 466 home runs, 10 gold gloves as an outfielder. And Andrew Jones last year got, what, 58.1%? So I think you'll probably see him about 66 67%, but he's not going to make that jump up there to 75 He's grown a little bit, but he needs about 6 or 7% a year to have a crack at this in two or three years. So Andrew Jones isn't going to get in. The tricky one of all these guys that's eligible for the first time, to me, is Joe Maurer. Joe Maurer won three batting titles and three gold gloves. Three batting titles as a catcher. Catchers don't win batting titles. So he's an anomaly. Three times as a three time batting champ as a catcher? Three gold gloves. But is he the best catcher of his generation? No, Yadier Molina was. Yadi played a couple more years than Joe. So Yadier Molina was the best catcher of his generation. Was Joe Mauer the best catcher? Was he the second best? I don't know. Buster Posey. Buster Posey won what? Three World Series with the Giants? Hit more home runs. Didn't win as many batting titles. Didn't win the gold gloves. Joe, Joe Maurer is going to be a tricky one. I think Joe Maurer's first year eligible is going to be about 50%. Then you have a guy like Chase Utley. I don't know what they're going to do with Chase Utley. I don't. But 249 home runs as a second baseman. Over 2,000 hits. I... So looking at all these guys, and then, you know, like I said, you've got guys on there that have been floating around for years, that the Andy Pettits, the Sheffields, the Omar Vizquels, those guys, no. It's not going not gonna to happen for them. So I, I look at the muddy waters, and again, I, I think next year. If I had to guess. If I had to guess next year. And then look, a guy that I forgot, you know, I mentioned Adrian Beltran. Carlos Beltran had what? 355, over 350 stolen bases, over 350 home runs. Look, these guys are eventually going to get it as time goes by. He's got to clear up the ballot a little bit. It's kind of like the NFL. The NFL puts six guys in a year. Baseball puts two or three. With Roland McGriff going in, if I if I had to venture a guess, I really, really had to venture a guess, I'd say it'd be Beltre. I'd say it'd be Helton. And I think Wagner would come up just short. And Andrew Jones would make that next big jump. And then a year from now, I think two guys get in. But how many of these guys could get in? If Andrew Jones gets a push and Wagner gets a push, you can get four. And Mauer's the one that I, I don't know. I just don't. So I think you get two guys this year. Or next year, I should say, after seeing what we saw. And then the following year, then Katie bar the door. You may see four or five guys get in. But baseball's still, you know, plucking away when it comes to some of these guys. But that's what next year looks like, at least on the ballot. Okay. Uh, SEC. SEC media days, you know, before Twitter and social media, this was your first in, in nonstop web coverage. This was your first real, in the SEC network, this is your first real peek into who these guys are and who the newcomers are. Now you have, you're exposed 24-7, 365. So this isn't what it was, just not. But there's a telling sign when it comes to this. Who the media voted for first, second, and third team, and who they voted to win. Alabama only has one offensive player on first team. J.C. Latham, a uh, running back. Only tied. Only, only, member of the off, only member on offense. Um, Jaden Daniels, first team quarterback. Oh, okay. Here's what's interesting. Georgia picked to win the East. Bama picked to win the West. All right. I thought LSU would be picked to win the West, but Alabama LSU is in Tuscaloosa. So uh, uh, maybe that's thinking. And when do you see Nick Saban go back-to-back -back years without winning the East or winning the West? Last year for divisions, I, I look at it this way. Um, Bama, LSU, that's fine. A&M third, Ole Miss fourth, Arkansas fifth. I think the way Lane Kiffin, you, you could flip those. I, I get why Auburn and Mississippi State are at the bottom. 
new coaches. Uh, makes sense. Although Gus Malzahn would get that cooking in a hurry. In the East, Georgia, Tennessee, South Carolina. Makes sense. Kentucky, Florida. You could flip Kentucky and Florida, maybe. But Florida has quarterback question marks. Florida, not a first or second teamer on offense, defense, or special teams. Trevor Etienne, third team running back. Uh, the fact that five members of the media picked Vanderbilt to win the conference is one of those things that scratches your head. And, I mean, how serious do you take this? Members of the media wonder why people don't take them serious. I, I think that's why you should make all this public who you voted for. I'd love to hear these five <laughs> dudes explain why they think Vanderbilt's winning the conference. Uh, oof. Here's what I think is interesting. Alabama wins the West. Georgia wins the East. Georgia wins it all. Wins the SEC, anyway, according to the members of the media. Alabama or Georgia doesn't have a quarterback on any of the teams. Jaden Daniels, first team, LSU. K.J. Jefferson, second team, Arkansas. Then you have, I want to make sure I get this right, Milton and Will Rogers, Milton, Tennessee, Will Rogers, Mississippi State. So they tied for third team. So the, fur, the four, and then you could probably make a case that Spencer Rattler would be five, right? Alabama and Georgia did not have a first, second, or third team quarterback. Didn't have any. But yet they're still picked to win the conference. So you have members of the media that said around only one Alabama guy makes first-team offense, J.C. Latham. And neither team has a quarterback, first, second, or third team. And actually, there's a third-team tie, and you can make a case that Benton Rattler's fifth. So people looking around going, yeah, none of these Alabama or Georgia quarterbacks do anything for me. They're not first, second, third team, not even fourth. Uh, but they're still going to win the conference. It shows you how deep and how awesome and how talented – both of those rosters are. Just sheer domination. Sheer total domination. Um, again, I mentioned Princely on the defensive line. Jason Marshall, DB, third team Florida defense. So Florida had no first or second teamers. One third teamer at running back. Two third teamers on defense. This talent's not there yet. This is not. So, I mean, what, what do you want to say here at this point? Going to get a good test for Utah out of the gate, but what you see Florida talent-wise, and some of these guys will develop, but the thing is, I don't know how many of these guys getting experience next year are going to be pushed. Let's Billy Napier have a top five recruiting class coming in as of right now. He's finally got that recruiting ball rolling, but this year they'll know the system a little bit better, but they're not going to be as good on offense. So there you go. What do I think? I mean, I think it's tough to bet against Alabama back-to-back -back years, but LSU's got the better quarterback. If I had to pick, I'd pick LSU and Georgia, and I'd pick Georgia to beat them again. But I mean, Alabama could Alabama could go ten and or Alabama could go to eleven and one, and their only loss be to LSU. With the exception of Georgia, Georgia has to go to Tennessee. This conference, LSU, look, look, Alabama, LSU, Georgia, Tennessee, all four of those teams could win 10 games. Actually, I'd be surprised if they didn't. Tennessee, Alabama, Georgia, LSU, you should have four 10 game winners in the SEC. Reminds me of those teams about a decade ago where South Carolina, 10 game winner. Did you have Georgia, that was a 10 game winner. Alabama, LSU, both 10 game winners. I don't know if we ever got to five. I don't think the conference ever saw five, but four 10 game winners are likely. When to wrap with this? The Open Championship just took place. Look, this major is different because you have to get up at two in the morning here in the States if you want to watch it. And on Sunday, all I say is just make it interesting. Make it interesting for me to, to, to not go outside on a beautiful day. It wasn't a beautiful day in Gainesville. But I still got in my car, and I went to get groceries, and I went and watched a movie. Oppenheimer, it's really. Oof. God, Christopher Nolan's brilliant. Uh, but I, 
Brian Harmon, yeah, okay, he wins by six shots. Got to be happy for him. Okay, but it's not interesting. Oh, it's a great story. Okay. Golf started off with so much promise. John Rahm, Brooks Kepka, and then what do we have after that? Wyndham Clark, great. Brian Harmon, great. And another year goes by. What's it been now? Seven, six years? I wrote these three names down because I want you to remember. It's important. Jordan Spieth. Roy McIlroy. It's been a decade now since Roy McIlroy won a major. I, I And then Dustin Johnson's the other one. Dustin Johnson, Roy McIlroy, Jordan Spieth. And then you know, the, the Jason Days, the Ricky Fowlers, those guys in there that can make things interesting. And I, I know that Rory was around on Sunday. John Rahm was around on Sunday. But, you know, two first-time winners. You know, I, I look at it this way. As long as Kepka can win a major every year, <laughs> Pretty high ceiling, right? But as long as like if Brooks Kepka come out and win the Masters next year, oh, oh okay. He's got what? He's got six. Brooks Kepka's got six majors. Got five, six. So we can start to have these discussions as he starts to move forward here about can he get to double digits? Oh my gosh! And you get to rarefied air where only three guys have gone before. And but still, golf just can't. You know, with the Live Tour, it just can't build. It, it couldn't pick up any momentum. John Rahm. Brooks Kepka set a stage. Could you imagine John Ron, Brooks Kepka, Roy McIlroy challenge for the U.S. Open challenge, for, but never got there. Brian Harmon winning the PGA champ or the, the, the Open Championship. You forget about it in forty-eight hours. First-time winners only work if they're building something. Again, I'm happy for him. It's not good for golf. It's not. So there you go. Our Bond Sports, the Bar Podcast, Media, Audio, Radio Network. Follow, share, like, subscribe. At Harp on Sports Twitter, at Harp on Sports Instagram. Harp on Sports Facebook page. Harp on Sports, the Bar, the YouTube channel. Auditory Route, Buzzsprout, Spotify, Apple Podcast. Also, you can check it out. HarpOnSports.com. Whole page lined up for you. I'm going to be filling in all week long. Shane Matthews Podcast, Put Up with Matthews. You can check that out. I share that on my Facebook page. And uh, I can't thank Shane enough for letting me uh, be his backup quarterback uh, as we wrap up the month of July. Remember, stay clean, stay focused, stay strong. Frankenstein, have fun with your friends.